Hello again, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Uh, let's back up here a little bit. Um, well, actually, no, I can get through the intro there. And first weather graphic here, the hazardous weather. And starting down the south part there, eastern Aleutian Alaska Peninsula, winter weather advisory out uh, for those areas uh, <clears throat> tonight and I believe through tomorrow as well for the for snow and blowing snow uh, to continue. Uh, today conditions uh, pretty windy and that dropping visibility is temperatures into the upper 20s there with snowfall levels down to sea level again to the Aleutians and southward. And uh, let's see the uh, winds King Cove gusting out of the north northwest to 70 miles per hour this afternoon and anywhere from 40 to 50 miles an hour for the Eastern Aleutians on up to uh, St. George Island. They had a gust 55 miles an hour and they had visibilities down to a quarter mile in snow and blowing snow there. And also visibilities running a half to a quarter mile there in the Western Alaska Peninsula. Not quite as low there on the Eastern Aleutians on Alaska, uh, but uh, again, the wind weather advisories will continue there through tonight with those conditions. Maybe a little lighter wind or winds will be lighter tomorrow, but the same pattern will continue. Uh, and uh, even then it should improve uh, tomorrow night and into Tuesday, but not end completely. Otherwise, the red area, that's a uh, blizzard warning, and that's uh, for the area along the Cuscoam Delta coastline, north of Tuxuk Bay, and that's out uh, throughout the night tonight for snow, blowing snow, visibilities down to less than a quarter mile at times. Not too much different what the uh, Alaska Peninsula Eastern Aleutians Prairie Lost are seeing. And also for St. Lawrence Island, winter weather advisory out tonight through tomorrow for that for the island and also for the uh, Bering Sea uh, coast there up to Shishmaref and as well as the northwest coast. Uh, Kivalina seeing gusts 40, 45 miles an hour today, snow and blowing snow. Tin City gusts, I believe, 58 miles an hour out of the north. So uh, again, that's just uh, creating low visibilities in blowing snow. Otherwise, that's it for the warnings, watches, and advisories. Uh, around the state and on the satellite imagery here you can see uh, wound up low there east of Kodiak Island and uh, moisture another round coming up to the North Gulf Coast and into the Panhandle and warmer air coming with that with the southerly flow there as the cold air plunges southward over the central eastern Bering Sea to the Aleutians and uh, the rain or the uh, snow changed to rain at 6 a.m. this morning at Haines uh, up there so the uh, winter weather or the winter storm warning is about over or it is over uh, with rain falling just about most of the areas there, unless you get high enough. And uh, they had about eight tenths of an inch uh, water equivalent precipitation in the last 12 hours. And again, uh, that fell as snow up until about 6 a.m. And then areas of uh, gusty winds and precipitation on down the southeast coast. I believe uh, Wrangell had, uh, or I'm sorry, Petersburg picked up an inch of precipitation even today. Juneau about four tenths, uh, same 12 hour period. Uh, Juneau again four tenths of an inch and they're seeing gusts uh, southeast to 36 miles per hour. Even stronger winds down at Lincoln Island southwest of Wrangell. They had gusts 62 miles an hour and Cape Decision had a peak wind gust of 55 miles per hour. Otherwise uh, gusty winds also along the North Gulf Coast and offshore there in Middleton Island had gusts about 55 miles an hour as well. And then precipitation kind of a uh, narrow, heavier area occurring over the northern Kenai Peninsula in the form of snow anywhere from uh, 8 to 10 inches of snow falling. Places like, uh, let's see, uh, Grandview, Alaska Railroad at the Tunnel, as well as at Alaska and at Granite, uh, picking up a fair amount of snow and precipitation uh, during the day today in that general area there out toward Passage Canal. And uh, although Cordova just a quarter of an inch and that fell as rain, so it's kind of an isolated area there of heavy precipitation, northern Kenai Peninsula in toward, uh, again, Alaska Girdwood. Otherwise, uh, areas of light snow, Arctic coast, nothing too significant up there. And then the gusty winds you can see coming southward there 
uh, kind of the higher level clouds obscuring that north to south flow of the lower, le lower level moisture, but uh, look, uh, clearing out towards Humianat too. On the chart today, uh, again, system pulling with the uh, frontal boundary coming northward. That'll weaken tonight, and uh, the low sets up and pulls back to the west there, kind of hangs out south of the Alaska Peninsula, and that's going to keep the strong northerly winds in force there over the eastern Bering Sea to the eastern Aleutians winter weather advisories, but it should gradually improve along the Cuscombe Delta coast. And wind and rain will be lighter, but won't end completely for the Panhandle North Gulf Coast. Not much change over the interior for uh, tomorrow. Next system rolls northward uh, with the anchor low there south of the Alaska Peninsula. Systems continue to form and move north and then northwest, kind of breaking up all over the northeast Gulf of Alaska. And so another round of wind and rain starts on the southern panhandle tomorrow with gale force winds, and that'll move northward tomorrow night and into Wednesday and weaken considerably. And then for Tuesday, you can see uh, uh, just a weak trough and a low still just south west southwest Kodiak Island. South to southeast flow keeps surges of moisture and unsettled conditions for the entire North Gulf Coast, heaviest in the panhandle. Look for some light snow up over the northern interior areas, otherwise dry in the south and uh, improving slowly over the Bering Sea and the Aleutians. Lows tonight below zero, Brooks Range on up toward the Arctic coast and maybe the uh, eastern areas there, North Waitoke, uh, Chuck Yitzik and uh, mild in the panhandle has continued southerly flow. Highs tomorrow, mid-teens for the central Tanana Valley and right around zero to a little below for the North Slope and uh, up mid-30s to mid-40s for the panhandle, near 40 Kodiak Island, lower 30s for the Aleutians and for the hot lows the following morning, not much different from uh, tomorrow morning, say either side of zero for the central interior to maybe 14 below for Toke and four below Golcana and near freezing for Kodiak and the highs for Tuesday afternoon, mid-30s to mostly lower to mid-40s for the Panhandle, mid-20s South Central Alaska, and in the teens in the interior to a little below zero for the Arctic coastal areas. Otherwise, out west, it'll range from 4 at Gamble to 24. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. We've gone to flying weather. Up north uh, to start, Arctic coast, uh, central and eastern Boulevard Sea coast, IFR, and then otherwise marginal for the west side and the north slope into the Brooks Range. With some more IFR there from the eastern Brooks Range, slipping on down into the, uh, about south to the Yukon River there, and then the eastern interior down the Alaska Range, marginal, and marginal VFR over the southeast, or s southern Alaska from actually the uh, central interior there southward with some VFR due to downsloping off the mountainous terrain there for the area from Anchor Point on up into the Susitna Valley, part of the Madnuska Valley, IFR, Prince Liam Sound, and IFR uh, for areas of the Panhandle, otherwise marginal at best there. IFR sneaking up to the southwest side of Kodiak Island and then back to the west across the Alaska Peninsula and uh, eastern Aleutians as well as the Pribilof Islands. Marshall for much of the Bering Sea and the Aleutians, but conditions improve as you head out west, uh, breaking out the VFR uh, for the areas west of Kiska Island. VFR also for the Yukon Delta and uh, Southern Seward Peninsula, Northwest Coast and the uh, Northwest Valleys. And then for the afternoon, we'll see that, uh, let's see here, there we are. IFR continues eastern and central Beaufort Sea Coast on down across eastern North Slope to the maybe getting a little south of the Brooks Range, but not much, most of it hanging up there. So upper Yukon Valley, or most of the uh, Yukon River Valley area there will be marginal VFR right on down to the Delta, and they'll turn IFR there along the coast, Nunavak Island, St. Matthew, Pribilofs, Eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula, and Southwest Kodiak Island, all VFR, as well as Bristol Bay. Uh, and then IFR from the Prince William Sound area, eastern North Gulf Coast to Yakutat, and for the southern panhandle, marginal in the north, but still quite an area IFR there off the southeast coast. And uh, again, conditions better over the far western Aleutians, as well as uh, Seward Peninsula into the Noatak Valley, as well as Selawik and uh, Kobuk Valley as well. And then for the Tuesday morning outlook, we've got uh, IFR there extending from Norton Sound, Norton Bay area, actually the uh, Nolato Hills westward to St. Lawrence Island and along the uh, coast of the south side of the Seward Peninsula there and then wrapping back around uh, covering Nunavak Island to the Pribilofs and continuing down to the uh, north side of the Alaska Peninsula into Bristol Bay and now all of Kodiak Island IFR, Fognak Island Marginal, 
Cook Inlet up to just north of the Forelands, Marshall VFR in the North Gulf Coast, still some IFR hanging there over the eastern ra coast range there, possibly uh, Valdez eastward, mostly in the mountains, and for the eastern panhandle. And uh, out west, uh, marginal VFR, central western Aleutians, narrow band of VFR uh, catching Unmac Island. And then for the afternoon, that uh, narrow band kind of shifts back to the west a little bit, and the IFR pushes west of Nunavak Island, still sitting on top of the Pribilofs, and extending eastward across all of Bristol Bay, now all of Kodiak Island IFR, St. Lawrence Island IFR, and uh, areas of VFR with some areas of marginal VFR with the southern central interior, IFR up there along the uh, Arctic coast and most of the North Slope, and still IFR or marginal for the Panhandle with uh, looks like Prince of Wales Island, Lynn Canal, Glacier Bay areas, Juneau in the marginal VFR categories. And for Anatovic, marginal tomorrow, same forecast for Adigan, look for occasional marginal VFR. Lake Clark and Merrill, also marginal, rainy, a little bit better, I'll call it VFR with the marginal conditions on the eastern approach. Windy VFR, Isabel back to marginal, and then Mentasta south side, maybe some marginal VFR, otherwise not too bad. Tanita, um, possible marginal VFR eastern entrance. And Portage, lowest conditions continue on the eastern entrance, probably IFR. Chilkoot and White, IFR, but improving to marginal in the afternoon. Freezing levels about 2,000 feet uh, over the southern southeast coast, and then at the surface, hugging the coastline all the way down Alaska Peninsula, but south of the eastern and central Aleutians. Icing, we've got uh, still moisture coming uh, northward and north westward for the Kenai Peninsula and then southwestward or south southwest into the pan also areas of uh, possible considerable moderate rime or mixed icing and at uh, jet stream level here we've got uh, strongest jet still south of the forecast area but about 65 to 90 knots uh, creeping in toward the southern southeast coast 9,000 feet uh, next system southwest of the Queen Charlotte's and that stronger wind pattern won't be in until uh, probably Monday night and for the uh, 3,000 foot wind flow chart, 50 knot northerlies there for the eastern Aleutians. And turbulence, moderate chop, all of the southern coastline, as well as uh, just about all the Aleutian. Uh, Some places on the surface, you might have these steep cracks and giant fissures that you would have to be careful not to fall into. In other places, you might see towers of ice right next to places that were relatively smooth. You might see places that were dark. Uh, ice there takes the form of rock. It's frozen solid until you dig down into that ocean. So you may see some things that look similar to Earth, but you may see some things that are very different. That voice you just heard? I am Morgan Cable, Morgan. NASA scientist. I love it. That's Morgan. <laughs> She's probably one of NASA's best spokespeople for exploring our solar system's icy moons. Europa is a fascinating place. It has this liquid water ocean that's about three times the volume of all of Earth's oceans combined. That's a lot of water. To understand what makes Earth so special, sometimes you need to back up and take in the big picture. Remember, the cryosphere is every place on Earth with frozen water. And water is one of the biggest indicators for life. Every place, at least so far, that we have found life, we found water along with it. And so far, Earth is the only planet we know of with life. Although Europa isn't the only icy moon in our solar system, NASA has identified it as one of those places with key astrobiological potential. Morgan is a collaborator on the Mapping Imaging Spectrometer for Europa, an instrument selected for NASA's next mission to Jupiter's icy moon Europa. But she's also more than just a scientist working in a laboratory. She's preparing future NASA missions for success on the surface of alien worlds. This year, Morgan and her colleagues were in the field studying how life colonizes in fresh lava. Earth, it turns out, has a lot of excellent, what we call, analog environments. Places that are similar enough to some of these other worlds 
that we can conduct some tests and we can um, do some analyses here. Now they're not perfect, of course. They're not going to be exactly like Europa, but we can still learn a lot by testing in these environments. Some of these places include Antarctica and the Arctic Circle, but there are other places too, uh, Alaska, Greenland, even Iceland. Uh, any place where you have a lot of ice, because guess what the surface of Europa is made of? A lot of ice. Studying the cryosphere doesn't just have big implications for Earth. It also matters for the frozen worlds in our own cosmic backyard. If we're able to find life uh, or evidence of past life on a place like Europa, that tells us that not only can life happen in other places, but it's common enough that it happened at least twice in the same tiny solar system. That means that the universe is wide open in terms of how much life we might find, the types of life we might find. It would revolutionize how we see ourselves and the possibilities for contact in the universe. It's just, it would be amazing. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> As it flows down the valleys, it actually carves those valleys out and it makes them deeper. And so it creates these beautiful fjords uh, where the ice flows down, snakes out uh, down to the ocean or to the lakes or further inland. And so that ice is flowing, it's moving. My interest in glaciers comes from the sheer size of these things and how much they're able to change on human timescales. And so the amount of, of mass and energy being transferred by glaciers around the globe is, is tremendous. It's uh, an absolutely fascinating thing to study from space. Mountain glaciers are some of the most charismatic parts of the cryosphere. Some might cling to the edges of cliffs at higher elevations, then lay bare and flat in a broad plain, looking cracked and weathered like elephant skin, before tumbling thousands of feet toward the sea and terminating in a dramatic calving front. They're like motion frozen in time, until they aren't. They tell a story about the distant past and yet are incredibly responsive to the present. You can understand why they'd be captivating to all of us, and especially cryospheric scientists. Meet Alex Gardner, a cryospheric scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who is going to help break down what a classic West Coast North American glacier might look like, where high amounts of snow dump onto the mountains. And at higher elevations, there's melt in summer, but not enough melt to get rid of all of that snow. And so that snow accumulates, it compacts, it turns into ice, and it starts to flow under its own weight, and it flows down the valleys. And as it flows down the valleys, it actually carves those valleys out, and it makes them deeper. And so it creates these beautiful fjords uh, where the ice flows down, snakes out down to the ocean or to the lakes or further inland. And so that ice is flowing, it's moving. Alex uses satellite data to study large-scale changes in glacial ice. But 2,000 miles to the north, Chris Larson from the University of Alaska Fairbanks spends a lot of time studying glaciers from the air. He's been flying over Alaskan mountain glaciers for many years, most recently on a NASA-funded mission called Operation Ice Bridge Alaska. He's absolutely enamored with his local rivers of ice. And uh, what, what do you love about mountain glaciers? Well, they're in mountains, so they're really pretty. <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better way to experience Alaska on a large scale than to go flying around for campaign after campaign and look at all of the mountains in Alaska. Truly infinite. You just uh, feel like you'll never see the end of them and don't want to either. But Chris doesn't spend weeks away from home and family for the views. Chris and his colleagues at NASA want to answer some pretty big questions by learning more about Alaskan glaciers and how they tick. 
you know, what, why does NASA care about these? Well, they, they actually disproportionately contribute a large amount to sea level rise. In the long run, as the Earth warms due to climate change, the big ice sheets and mighty outlet glaciers of Greenland and Antarctica stand to contribute the most to sea level rise, simply because the vast majority of the planet's ice is stored there. But currently, it's the world's smaller mountain glaciers in comparatively warmer places, like Alaska and Patagonia, that are contributing about a third of all inputs to sea level rise, even though they account for only 1% of the world's ice. It's mostly due to them being dynamic. They have water at the bed, which allows them to slide fast, and uh, they react quickly to climate change and have higher velocities than their polar counterparts. Back at JPL, Alex uses satellite measurements of global ice and computer models to predict ultimately how much sea level rise we might see due to climate change. But in the case of mountain glaciers, we also care about the local impacts of disappearing ice. When we think of, of changes in ice sheets, we typically think of, of just what is the consequence for, for sea level rise and the future evolution of the ice sheets. But glaciers in other regions, like High Mountain Asia, Alaska, the European Alps, these are places where changes in runoff matters to stream flows. In places like High Mountain Asia, you have a lot of glaciers that feed the streams that flow down to uh, populated regions. And that runoff becomes significant for water resources, irrigation, and agriculture. Both Alex and Chris are passionate about understanding how glaciers are changing and what it means for our planet's future. They'll continue to use tools like elevation maps from the ISAT-2 satellite and detailed airborne measurements to monitor changing ice. By the end of the tunnel, you're about 100 feet underground, and you're surrounded by bones sticking out of the wall from the steppe bison and the mastodons. There's sticks that are 40,000 years old. There's grass that's still green that's tens of thousands of years old. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Back uh, looking at uh, today's sea ice analysis and, whoops, a little too soon there, continuing to expand uh, southward and uh, southwestward, a little, in a little closer to St. Matthew Island now and well past Nunavak Island and increasing there in Togiak Bay from what it was and even uh, eastern Bristol Bay a little bit. And for the coastal water forecast, strongest winds uh, will be on the south coast there, uh, up to 45 knots as the next system approaches. Uh, along Prince of Wales Island coastline, and then gales 35 to 40 knots southeast winds with 20 to 25 foot seas, and then small craft advisories on the north coast, southeast 25. Southeast 25 also for Stevens Passage, gale warnings for Clarence Strait, that in the afternoon, coming up to 35 in the afternoon out of the south, and then south 15 for Lynn Canal. For Tuesday, westerly winds 30 knots, uh, small craft advisories on the south coast there. Otherwise, a uh, Lighter winds up to the north, central coast, uh, west-southwest 15 to 20 knots, north coast, southwest 15, seas 15 to 23 feet, and south 25 for Clarence Strait, 15 knots from the southeast for Stevens Passage, and about 20 knots for Lynn Canal. And for Prince William Sound, small craft advisories tomorrow, east winds 25 knots, seas about 6 feet, and then southeast 30 knot winds for the Middle Island uh, Marine Zone there. And for the uh, western North Gulf Coast and the Barren Islands, uh, east 30 knots, seas 15 feet, gale warnings for Kamishak Bay, northeast 35, Cook Inlet, pre uniform wind pattern, northeast 30 knots, and sea 6 to 9 feet. Small crowds advisories will continue for Cook Inlet on Tuesday with northeast winds 25 for the northern areas and south of the forelands 30 knots, turn east 30 knots, Kamishak Bay, Barren Islands down to 20 knots from the southeast, otherwise North Gulf Coast, southeast 25, and Prince Liam Sound east at 20 with four foot seas. Kodiak Island, small craft advisories, uh, southeast 25 there on the east side, Shilikoff Strait, a little stronger from the northeast at 30 knots. And then uh, north to northwest winds at 30 knots, a little lighter than uh, today there for the Alaska Peninsula with 14 to 15 foot seas, small craft advisories, Bristol Bay, northeast at 25. And even lighter winds in store for Bristol Bay on Tuesday, north to 25, seas three feet. And the Alaska Peninsula still looking at uh, 
Small Craft Advisory wins uh, holding on there. Northwest on the Bering Sea side, 25 knots. West, 30 knots. Pacific side. And then from uh, Castle Cape, up the east side of Kodiak Island, south-southwest winds at 25 knots. Shelikoff Street down to 15 knots from the east. Unalaska Island tomorrow, or actually the Eastern Illusions, both uh, Unmak, Unalaska Island, northwest, 35 to 40 knots, gale warnings, and uh, 30 knot northwest winds for Adak and Atka. And then those winds become lighter and westerly for Amchitka, 25 knots, and then back up to 30 knots from Kiska to Shimia. And for Tuesday, no change from Shimia to Kiska, west 30 knots, 13 foot seas, and then back to the gales for Amchitka Island, northwest 40 knots. Small craft advisories for Adak and Atka, where winds will be northwest 25 to 30. And we're looking at uh, mostly westerly winds at 30 knots for the Fox Islands with seas running 11 to 14 feet. Southwest coast, uh, north winds 30 knots tomorrow. Good for uh, brisk wind advisories along the Yukon Delta Coast and small craft advisories for the Cuscomb Delta Coast. Gales for the Pribloss Northwest 35, St. Matthew Island north at 30. And uh, gales for St. Lawrence Island, north winds 30 knots. Those come down to, or I'm sorry, at 40 knots. They come down to 30 knots uh, for the forecast for Tuesday there for St. Lawrence Island. 25 knot winds there for the Yukon Delta coastline and south of Nunavak Island, northwest to 20. Small craft advisories for the Pribilof Islands, northwest 25 and north 25, St. Matthew Island. And for the central eastern Beaufort Sea coast tomorrow, brisk wind advisories, east sustained, 25 knots, 20 knot northeast winds on the west side, back to small craft advisories, Cape Beaufort to Cape Thompson for north at 30, and then gale warnings, Cape Thompson to Wales for 35 knot northerly winds. And then uh, on Tuesday, uh, central and uh, east side, east, brisk wind advisories, 25 to 30 knots, turn northeast at 30 knots uh, from uh, for all the way down to Cape Thompson, then north at 30, Cape Thompson to Wales. And for tonight, again, uh, big low there near the Alaska Peninsula continues to spin moisture up and uh, into the Panhandle and all of the North Gulf Coast to Kodiak Island. Uh, and then winter weather advisories are out for the Eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula tonight into tomorrow. And uh, blizzard warning should start to end later tonight for the uh, Cuscombe Delta and dry over the interior. And winds coming down a little bit from what they were today, like Indian Mountain Gust 40, you probably won't see that tomorrow, but it'll stay pretty windy with snow and blowing snow, purple off eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula. Next storm rolls into the panhandle and then is gone the next day. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.